Okay, welcome. Thank you all for joining us today for our lunchtime talk. Um, I wanted to go over a few um, updates, housekeeping information. Um, please keep yourself on mute. Uh, I wanted to plug some upcoming talks that we have. Our next lecture is um, March 17th on the Doctors Blackwell, uh, two sisters who were among the first female doctors. We also have a lecture March 30th on Pamela Coleman Smith's New York. Uh, April 7th is our fundraising event on um, Obsessed by Light. Uh, it's a new Loie Fuller documentary and we'll be having a conversation with the filmmakers. Uh, May 5th, we have a talk on the Waldorf Astoria. And May 10th, to wrap it up, we have a talk um, given by three emerging scholars. So that will be super exciting. And there's a link in the chat where you can um, register and find out more about all these programs. We are also co-sponsoring uh, two programs. On March 19th, um, the Friends of the Urban Organ are having um, a birthday party for uh, Urban. It's his 221st birthday and they have a book release uh, that's free. And on March 24th, uh, we have a book talk sponsored by uh, Village Preservation that's also free. It's uh, Rebel Cinderella from Rags to Riches uh, to Radical, the epic journey of Rose Pastor Stokes. Um, Okay, so without further ado, uh, Francesca Bauman is coming to us today from the UK. Uh, she, after studying history at Cambridge, uh, she began her career as the host of numerous British TV shows and has written six books, including The Pineapple King of Fruits and Shapely Ankle Preferred, A History of Lonely Hearts Advertisements. She also runs the Instagram account, Fran's Bookshop, where she talks to people about what they're reading, uh, interviews authors, and reviews books. Uh, today, she'll be speaking to us about Matrimony Inc., her latest publication. Hi, everyone. This is such fun, so fun to be here. So I am in Bath in Somerset in the UK. Um, which currently is, is best known for being where Bridgerton is filmed. Um, in fact, for those of you who've watched Bridgerton on Netflix, I can see Lady Danbury's house out of my window. So that's been the main excitement. It's, our, it's Bath's main claim to fame. It used to be that Jane Austen wrote about Bath and lived here, but now it's that Bridgerton is, is filmed here. So um, that's the main excitement here. Um, I'm thrilled to be talking to you about my new book, uh, Match Money Inc., uh, which came out in the US in November. It's a, weird time to have a book out during a pandemic but it's actually been lovely to be able to do these zooms and chats with you know people all around the united states so that's been really fun um so i'm going to talk a bit about the history of personal ads in america i'll give you a little overview and then um show you some ads uh in the from the 18th and mostly 19th century um uh and give you kind of an overview of what the book's about I've always been interested in personal ads. You know, when they used to be in the back of the newspaper and I'd, I'd always turn to them straight away on a Sunday morning with my coffee and croissant and read through the personal ads. You, you know, there's such an amazing insight into people's lives of man, men looking for women, and women looking for men and, and their kind of innermost desires right there in the Sunday newspaper for everyone to see. So I've always been interested in the subject. And then when I was thinking about my next book, so I, previously written a book about the history of the pineapple. So my thing is writing about the history of funny little subjects that give you a window into the history of a nation. When I was thinking about a subject for my next book, I, I started thinking about personal ads. And when I looked into them even for a moment, I found so many more personal ads in America than you might think. I was thrilled to find them dating right back to the, into the 18th century. I very quickly uncovered America's very first personal ads. And as I continued my research, months and months of trawling through newspapers, getting all square-eyed, sitting in the library, trawling through them, I was so amazed and thrilled to find personal ads in, in newspapers in every state in the nation. 
from Wyoming to Wisconsin and California to Kansas, really early on, you get these ads which will say, man seeks wife in, in black type or husband wanted in this headline. Um, right there, often on the front page of the newspaper, tiny local newspapers in tiny towns, as well as your big, you know, New York Times or San Francisco Chronicle. And as, as I began to accumulate these hundreds and hundreds of personal ads um, in the course of my research, as I say, in every state in the nation, they became the most extraordinary body of evidence of of really people's innermost desires, right? Of what men are looking for in a woman, what women are looking for in a man and how that's changed or, well, often not changed over the last 250 years. They, they're really an amazing um, source of evidence. You know, these 400 words roughly of like black blurry ink in the, in the newspaper can tell you so much about the history of America, really the making of modern America, but in a very uh, human way, almost the history of human emotion, as well as, crucially, the history of human mate choice. So these days, um, uh, a, a recent, a 2019 study for Stanford University found that 39% of Americans have met their partner via a dating website or a dating app. So 27% met in like a bar or a restaurant, um, I think it's 20% through friends and 11% at work. But 39%, more than anything else, people met through a dating website or app. So advertising for love. So what's interesting is to know that advertising for love in America is not a new thing, right? It's been around much, much longer than, than, anybody, um, than anybody realized. And as a result is a sort of amazing um, source of evidence. So um, really when I knew I, I was gonna write this book, uh, when I was like, this is the subject for me, was when I was fortunate enough to uncover a personal ad um, from Boston in 1759. So much, much, much earlier than anyone realized personal ads existed in America. Um, it was really a thrilling moment. Now, 1759 in Boston, what's interesting is you get the first personal ads almost as soon as you get the first newspapers and magazines, right? That the same happened in England. So England's first personal ad was 1695 which is really around the same time you get the first newspapers and magazines. And America followed the same trajectory. It's almost as if as soon as you have a new, um, you know, a new form of communication, newspapers, magazines, one of the very first uses for this is, that, is the forming of human relationships, right? It was the same with the internet. It was the same with smartphones. They've been used very early on for the forming of human relationships. And newspapers and magazines were no, no exception. So, as soon as you get those in America, 1740s, 1750s, you get the very first personal ads. Um, so I'm gonna show you America's first personal ad. Can everyone see that? Give me a thumbs up if you can see that, okay. Lovely. Okay, so this personal ad was in the Boston Evening Post. It appeared on February the 23rd, 1759. Any young lady between the age of 18 and 23 of a middling stature, brown hair, regular features and with a lively brisk eye, of good morals and not tinctured with anything that may sully so distinguishable a form, possessed of three or four thousand pounds entirely at her disposal, etc, etc. Um, they were asked to, anyone interested was asked to write to, to leave a letter at the British Coffee House in, in King Street. Um, you'll see at the end, they say profound secrecy will be observed, no trifling answers will be regarded. So this tells us so much, there's so much in there, I mean we could analyse this forever really, but um, some of the most interesting and revealing points uh, in here are what this gentleman in Boston in the 1750s wants in a wife is um, between the age of 18 and 23, so that is crucial. He wants somebody young, because I'm afraid that tends to mean fertile, right? And that from the very beginning of human mate choice, for good or ill, <laughs> is essential tenet of human mate choice because it's all evolutionary, right? Between the age of 18 and 23, middling stature, brown hair, good morals, three or 4,000 pounds. So in short, what he's really asking for is a woman who is young, respectable, and rich. 
right? <laughs> and you will see a through line in many of these personalities from gentlemen that that is what they wanted. They want, wanted somebody young, respectable, uh, and rich. Now, why was it Boston that hosted these first personal ads? Well, Boston at the time was the largest city in the United States and also had the most advanced print media. So, it, you know, it's, it's kind of no coincidence that, that that's, that's where it was to be found. But 1759 is really much, much earlier than it was thought these kind of ads existed in America, that it was thought people advertised for love. But in fact, it had been highly influenced by these kind of ads existing in England from the 1690s onwards, really becoming popular there in the 1720s. And so like many um, cultural issues of the day, um, the East Coast of America was still being quite influenced by England. Not anymore, thank goodness, but at this time, it really was. So that was a thrilling find for me. But before long, only 30 years later, came New York City's very first person ads. Um, the first one came in 1788. Um, and let me show it to you next. Here we go. This is one of New York City's earliest person ads. July 23rd, 1788, um, which uh, it was an interesting time in New York City. It was right when uh, there was a big debate going on about whether to adopt the nation's new constitution. And in fact, the very next day, or that day, I think, there was a big parade in New York City in favor of, of the new constitution. So it was a very exciting time, very political time, but some people had more personal matters on their mind, um, matters of the human heart. And here is one gentleman who had, seems to have decided it's time to find a wife. A young gentleman of family and fortune who has lately come to town, having little acquaintance with the ladies and being desirous of engaging in the holy and happy state of matrimony, presents his most serious respects to any lady, either maid or widow, etc., etc., etc. The gentleman in question is not above two and twenty, tall, stout, and esteemed agreeable in his person. Now, this next line is what really makes this personal ad spectacular. What is this New York City gentleman looking for in a future wife? It is expected the lady should be under 40, not deformed, and in possession of at least 1,000 pounds. Now that's not what you get on like, you know, ads today, is it? On Tinder or match.com or wherever you are. Under 40, not deformed, and in possession of at least 1,000 um, pounds. So it's a really interesting insight into what a typical New York City gentleman uh, was looking for in a way. Of course, in many respects, perhaps he wasn't entirely typical because at this date, it certainly wasn't common to advertise in the newspaper for a wife, but it did happen. And my, my suspicion is this may have been a British gentleman actually, um, who was more familiar with this type of, uh, uh, this way of looking for a wife. And that, that kind of gave him the idea, gave him the confidence to do it. Um, you'll see at the bottom, he says um, that letters should be left at the printing office on peck slip. Um, which I love to imagine, you know, because Pexlip obviously is still there in New York City. I love to imagine maybe various young ladies looking around, champing along the, cat, the cobbles on Pexlip, leaving their letter for this, this gentleman. Of course, we don't know what happened next. And that's always the frustrating element with, with these kind of ads. Sometimes, sometimes we find out, we'll see later on, but um, often we don't know what happened next. But, uh, but this ad I, I really love is one of, New York City's very earliest ones. Um, okay, I'm just gonna come out of this for a sec. Um, okay, now do you see me again? You see me again? Yeah? Cool. Um, okay, so those, in terms of the history of personal ads, um, you'll see they started in Boston and then New York City. And that was no coincidence because What's happened throughout the history of personal ads is that as soon as a city's population has reached a, a, certain, a certain level, personal ads suddenly become popular. So Boston hit about 20,000 people, and then New York City uh, hit about, <coughs> excuse me, hit about 33,000 people in the 1780s. And although by today's standards, obviously that's a very small number at the time, uh, that was a lot of people. People were new in town. They didn't necessarily know many people. You couldn't, you couldn't just marry like the girl next door, right? Or um, somebody you knew from college. So all of a sudden, 
matchmaking takes on a kind of new light, right? You suddenly need a bit of help with matchmaking. You can't just ask your friend or your mom or your pastor or whatever it is. As the population of these cities hits a certain number, people need a bit of support with the matchmaking process. And that really is what happened. Interesting to me is that this was also when the first novels were emerging in America. So 1791, you get The Power of Sympathy by William Hill Brown. And personal ads and novels, of course, do have a lot in common in terms of the emphasis on the individual, in terms of the collective experience of people reading them and kind of gossiping about them. And so, you know, these are new forms of text that are emerging um, in America. So, um, in the years after the revolution, so we're talking the 1790s, 1810s, 1820s, um, ads remained uncommon, but they did spread slowly all over the nation. And I'm going to show you a few of, of the very early ones. Um, okay, so here is another very early ad, 1818, um, an ad from Georgia the Savannah Republican, to matrimonial candidates, wanted a wife from 15 to 25 years of age. She must be of a respectable family, liberally educated, etc., capable of arranging a dinner table in the most modern style, also of entering a drawing or ballroom gracefully, edifying in conversation, truly chaste and partial to children. Again, really an insight into what a man in Georgia in 1818 was looking for um, uh, in a wife. Uh, I found other ads, not hundreds, but trawling through newspapers, still you know, enough to show that this was becoming more common. So one in Pennsylvania in 1824, Washington, D.C., 1827, oh, an ad that, where he says, looking for someone who will prefer historical, geographical, and biographical readings to light and frivolous novels. Uh, Virginia, 1838, must be fully competent to take charge of all household matters, and the more particularly well management of servants, as nothing is more disagreeable to the subscriber than complaint of their worthlessness and powers of teasing. So, you know, every time I came across one of these ads, it was thrilling. As I say, they weren't they weren't super common, but they did exist. Right, when they became, when personal ads became common in America was really around the 1840s. And the newspaper that kind of um, made them very mainstream was the Public Ledger in Philadelphia. That's when they really took off and you suddenly get lots and lots and lots of personal ads. The Public Ledger was the first one to regularly feature them. And here is one of the earliest ones in the public ledger on June 25th, 1841. Can you see it there <clears throat> in the middle of this to the ladies? So I've, I've done this slide like this to give you a bit of context of the other ads around it. To the ladies, wanted a wife by a man of middle age and respectable standing in society. The lady must be of good moral character, fair appearance, without encumbrance, not less than 40 nor more than 50 years of age. The advertiser is free from encumbrance, of respectable appearance and in easy circumstances. None need doubt his intentions or sincerity, etc, etc. Um, and yeah, this was 1841. Now have a look around this ad. Um, you know, it's so exciting to find it when it says, wanted a wife. That's a very exciting moment to me, but equally, I, I find it very hard not to get distracted by the ads around it because it's really, uh, you know, a, an insight into this teeming metropolis, really, for the, by, by the time standards, you know, everything you could possibly want to know. So wanted five musicians on brass instruments or board wanted a single gentleman wishes to obtain board. Um, what else? If the woman who received a Florence braid bonnet worth six dollars delivered Saturday night last by mistake will return the same. Uh, notices of things for sale, fire, a firework display. You know, this is the story of metrop uh, Metropolis in, in, in black ink. Um, and yet within there, while people are buying and selling, um, uh, and on the previous page, you get a report of a number of merchant ships that have sailed into ports. There's also a news story, um, a complaint about the stench from the gutter on Ninth Street in Philadelphia. 
There's an election coming up for the new sheriff. Oh, and lots and lots of ads for quack medicine, for like weird, crazy potions and lotions uh, that are supposed to cure you or heal you, but sound like they're mostly made of brandy or whiskey. Um, and then within this, within this cacophony of urban life, you get this, wanted a wife. And in this way, marriage is really becoming commercialized, right? Just like buying a horse or renting a room or whatever, marriage is becoming incorporated into the capitalist world in America. Um, and throughout the 1840s, the public ledger printed lots and lots and lots of these. I mean, maybe not lots by today's standards, but certainly one a day, one a day. They were generally from men in their 20s. Typical is something like, um, uh, a modest young man, 23 years of age, of good prospects. That's the kind of way they would describe themselves. Or a respectable young gentleman, well-established in a lucrative business. So these men, you know, they, they, they put their economic status front and centre. Other adjectives that, that they commonly used to describe themselves were healthy, moral, genteel, intelligent, in good health. Uh, a phrase I enjoy is when they say, not very ugly. It's rather an elegant way to speak about the way you look. Um, many of them would say, does not chew, drink or smoke. Uh, and in terms of what these Philadelphia men in the 1840s are looking for in a partner, well, again, I'm afraid always up front is between about 18 and 25, young, fertile, able to bear children. And that, of course, is, is evolution, right? Um, adjectives these men look for in a wife, they'll say they're looking for someone amiable, agreeable, good disposition. Refinement or respectability was very important, so there was some class consciousness there. Uh, of industrial habits or knowledge of housewifery, of course, domestic, want someone who'll sort the house out. Uh, these, these Philadelphia men tend to be very vague about physical appearance. They'll sort of say things like, must be well looking or should be of medium size. Um, occasionally they're a little more specific. Uh, I'm keen on the gentleman who, who was looking for a wife with clean skin, a sweet breath and a good set of teeth. <laughs> so the phraseology in here is always rather wonderful. Um, again, by this point, you know, Philadelphia had really become a big city. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of why these men turned to the newspapers to advertise, well, look, it was the nation's first major industrial metropolis. Um, it was Philadelphia during the revolution had a population of about 30,000 people. But by this stage, the 1840s, the population had expanded to 120,000 people. So that was huge, huge growth. And it was a result, again, there's lots of people in town who don't know many people. Lots of people, they'll say in their personal ads, I'm a stranger in the city, um, you know, they work long hours, they don't necessarily have time to meet people. A very similar story to today, right? People today will say, I find it hard to like fall in love or get a girlfriend or a boyfriend because I work really long hours, where can I meet people, et cetera, et cetera. Well, with any industrialized, urbanized society, that always is a problem. Um, some, some of these gentlemen in Philadelphia are honest about the fact, the fact they're just in a hurry. So there was one gentleman in 1842 who, who admitted, being closely confined by his business, he cannot devote the time necessary to a protracted courtship. So he's using the newspapers to find a wife because he's just in a hurry and wants to get on with it. Um, some, sweetly, are very shy. There was one gentleman who said in his personal ad, of rather a bashful retiring disposition, which has hitherto prevented him from mixing much in female society. So that's rather sweet. And as I say, you get lots of these ads in, in the public ledger in Philadelphia in the 1840s. They soon start to spread in the 1840s through to the 1850s. They spread to the rest of Philadelphia, um, the rest of Pennsylvania. So here's one I found in the Blairsville Appalachian in 1853, a newspaper with a slightly odd spelling, but there we are, it is correct. Um, and here we go, a wife wanted, again, this ad is in amongst, you know, House wanted, horse wanted, and here we go, a wife wanted. A young lady between 20 and 25 years of age, medium sized, good character, willing to reside in a country town in the western part of Pennsylvania, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea of advertising for love is starting to spread um, along the, the more um, 
the more populous areas of America. Here we go in North Carolina. So add a spreading down the East Coast. This is 1859. A wife wanted immediately by a young gentleman of this town having an education and a small competency and of domestic habits. So these ads gradually, gradually start to spread. Um, now, at this stage, people will often say to me, but what about ads from women? What about women looking for a husband? Well, there were far more personal ads from women than you might think. And from really, really early on, I was astonished by the number of husband wanted ads I found starting in the 1820s and then into the 1840s. Again, the first ones were often in the public ledger in, in Philadelphia. Now these ads were not all over the place, but there were far more than you might think. And what's wonderful is they're an amazing, you know, these women were not necessarily keeping diaries or writing memoirs. So often it's the only lasting evidence we have of these women's voices. So let me show you one of the first ads uh, from a woman looking for a husband. Here you go. Again, this was in the public ledger in 1840. Husband wanted. <laughs> the advertiser is desirous of changing single blessedness for matrimony. She's a few years above the teens, fine hair, hazel eyes, good teeth, etc., etc. Yeah, so the public ledger was the first paper to regularly feature them. Um, what I want to do is again show you it in context. So you'll see that ad. Um, can you see kind of? There we go. Oh no, hang on. Um, kind of in the second column from the left. There you can see this early husband wanted ad in context. You'll see it's surrounded by ads for a missing person, lost and found goods for sale, including like a fancy pigeon, <laughs> um, more quack medicines, cheap shoes, um, a good female cook. You can imagine how difficult it was for me not to get distracted during my research, because really, again, this is just, you know, so much fascinating material in here. But here it is in context. Um, other husband wanted ads, here's one from 1845 wanted a husband. What's interesting about this ad is uh, it says the qualifications are indus in industry, sobriety and honesty, one that is capable of making a wife happy. Now this is really interesting about human nature is because it was quite new in America to prioritize happiness when you were looking for a mate. Up until then it had really been an economic transaction. Marriage had been an economic transaction, a social transaction, but it was only from around this time, the 1840s, that happiness became a valued and acceptable criteria in terms of what you were looking for um, in, a, in a marriage. You know, the idea of a companion, companionate marriage was started to ha hold up, and it, it held up as a goal. And this is, is underscored by a lot of um, research that's been recently done into sort of uh, marriages in New England, people's diaries and letters when they talk about, you know, um, happiness being important these personal ads underscore a lot of scholarship that's been done recently um, in terms of that another husband wanted ad in the middle here do you see it husband wanted an american mechanic aged from 35 to 40 must be sober honest and and industrious now sober is very interesting that's an adjective that popped up a lot in these ads. And no wonder sobriety was a top priority because excessive drinking was really widespread at the time. It was really a problem in Philadelphia. So the over 15s consumed nearly seven gallons of alcohol a year, three times as much as today. And so no wonder these Philadelphia women made sure that they said up front that sobriety was, a, was one of the most important criteria of what they were looking for um, in a husband. Now, what did these women look for in a man? Generally around 40, respectable, honest, educated. Those are words that come up a lot. The women themselves give away very little about, about themselves. Um, you don't know much about them. Certainly they, at the time, women in Philadelphia were, were more literate, had more freedom and also wealthier, i.e. able to support, to put an ad like this in the newspaper. And again, ads from women spread. This is one of my very favorite personal ads. 
from Wisconsin in 1855. Again, a little tiny local newspaper in Wisconsin in 1855 in amongst all the other town business and there you go, husband wanted. This is one of my very fa favorites because towards the end of the ad, can you see? She says, I want no brainless dandy or foppish fool, but a practical man who can drive a coach or rock the cradle, hoe the garden or attend the ballroom. On the whole, he must dress neat, look well, and keep his head up in society. <laughs> I mean, amazing. No brainless dandy or foppish fool. So if any of you are looking for a man, I think that's definitely what you should look for. No brainless dandy nor foppish fool. Now, obviously women like this were not the norm, but what an amazing insight into one single woman in Wisconsin in, in 1855. Really sort of amazing. Um, possibly no coincidence that these ads became more common after the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls in 1848, really empowering women to have a voice rather than just waiting for some man to turn up, turn up and marry them in a sort of passive way. They were coming, becoming much more active, these women, in, in terms of going out and, and getting what they wanted. Okay, and before long, ads took off in New York City. The first newspaper in New York City to regularly feature personal ads was the New York Herald. This is the very first one. It's from 1835. A young lady about 21 years of age, pleasing manners and accomplished. And you'll see at the end, it says a letter addressed to Maria left at the Herald office will be noticed. Now brilliantly, a few weeks later, the editor of the New York Herald Mr. Bennett received a letter from Maria inviting him to her wedding. This ad had apparently been a success. At least that's what we're told. That was his story and he's sticking to it. Who thinks that maybe he made up that story to entertain his readers, drum up more personal ads, create a bit of drama? There's no way of knowing, but um, sometimes these ads can seem too good to be true. And then you do need to take them a, 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 with a pinch of salt. The New York Sun, one of New York City's uh, um, 19th century newspapers, also started featuring personal ads pretty early. This is one from 1840, from an advertiser who has lately arrived from the South, being unconnected with society here. As I said, often the reason people advertise for love turn to the newspapers rather than matchmaking in a more conventional way is because they're new in town. They don't have the contacts that other people have. And so they need to use this different form of communication to reach out to women. And then the New York Times started featuring them. The first personal ad in the New York Times was in 1852, despite the fact that in 2001, the New York Times put out a press release saying they were gonna start featuring personal ads for the first time ever. Even the New York Times don't know they had these ads, right? But as I trawled through the New York Times, I found Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. This is the very first personal ad in the New York Times. November the 29th, 1852. I know it's a bit tiny here and hard to see, but I wanted to show you it in context. Context, it's the second column from the left, right at the bottom. The headline says, a young wife wanted. It's just under, a woman wanted to do general housework. Some might argue, what's the difference? <laughs> so, you know, you're really conflating a wife and a, domestic servant, and it all gets conflated in, in these personal columns. This is the first one in the New York Times. A young wife wanted, uh, the, the gentleman advertising describes himself as a young gentleman of respectable appearance and address, having formed a business connection, etc., etc. He also says, any lady willing to forego the frivolities of a silly courtship for the more immediate prospect of a sensible marriage. So again, He's turning to the newspapers because he thinks it's more efficient, which is perhaps not the most romantic way to find a wife, but you know, probably worked fine. And from then on, in the 1850s, I found about one ad a week in the New York Times in the 1850s. Um, here's a brilliant one from 1859 from a woman, Miss Ward, who is rather too honest. Here's what she says. Without beauty to attract the world's crowd or gold to allure the fortune hunter, I am, I believe, 
a true-hearted, refined, educated woman, young, frank and mirthful. Possibly also a little bit too honest. Uh, but again, the sort of personality that comes through in these personal ads is astonishing. You're really getting a, an insight into people's um, most intimate, so, well, desires or the way they want to present themselves, right? It's a way of presenting themselves on the pages of the newspaper, unfiltered or at least filtered in the way Miss Ward wants to filter herself. She'd probably never seen herself on the pages of a newspaper before. So how thrilling for the first time to see yourself there. One wonders whether Miss Ward ever did find a husband who wasn't worried about beauty or having a fortune. Let's hope that she did. Um, there were so many ads at this time because the population of New York City was growing very fast. And this is what, when one wonders, what happened next? Like, will we ever know what happened next? And occasionally, thrillingly, it was possible to find out. So here's an ad from the New York Herald in 1879. It was placed actually just after the writer Mark Twain wrote this. Mark Twain said, Mark Twain wrote, you may sit in a New York restaurant in the morning for a few hours and you will observe that the very first thing each man does before ordering his breakfast is to call for the Herald. And the next thing he does is to look at the top of the first column and read the personals. There is such a toothsome flavor of mystery about them. So that's Mark Twain. And here's, you know, just one of those ads. Um, I was able to track down S-E-R. Her name was Sarah Redmond and she was born in Brooklyn. She had siblings and then a stepfather who turned up and one imagines maybe was quite keen to get her married off and out of the house. To this ad, she got lots and lots of replies, including one that she rather liked postmarked Hawkinsville, Georgia. She got on the train, she took her mum and her brother with her. They got the train, then a stagecoach, traveled through the night and turned up at the address in the letter. Knock, knock, knock. A very old, very ill looking man opened the door. Sarah Redmond had been conned, um, as was often the way, I'm afraid, with these early ads. I know all this from a report for the Atlanta Constitution when a reporter for that newspaper happened to bump into Sarah Redmond um, on the train platform as she was weeping on her way back to New York City to carry on her hunt for a husband. But so that was a sort of exciting way where we were able to track what happened next. Obviously, often these stories are easier to track when things go badly, when something goes wrong, when, a crime, when a crime is committed. They're hard to track when everyone just lives happily ever after, right? Because that's not a news story. And then people probably kept that to themselves about how they met. So it's definitely harder to track the happier stories um, yeah, to track the happier stories than the, than the sad ones. Okay. Ads continued to spread and became really crucial on the American frontier. I'm going to start whizzing through them now, but um, here's one from the, in Oregon. Do you see a wife wanted? Because there was such a dire shortage of women on, on the frontier at this time. And, and as one Iowa newspaper said, Iowa newspaper said, so anxious are our settlers for wives that they never ask a single lady her age. All they require is teeth. Um, in Iowa at the time, men outnumbered women by three to one and, and Oregon wasn't, wasn't far behind. So personal ads were one way that men who had ended up on the frontier could, could meet women in this way. They really became crucial to fulfilling the idea of manifest destiny, right? Because you can't settle a nation if there aren't any women around. This one's in Ohio, 1862. This one is it, you'll see in the top right, tiny, tiny, a farmer wishes to correspond with a farmer's widow or daughter, object matrimony. So here are these, you know, they're farmer in rural Michigan turning to the newspapers to, to help him find a wife. Kansas, quite a lot of ads in Kansas in the 1870s. Um, there's also a wonderful one from a woman I like from 1882, where she says, I, it's coming on spring now and I'm a lone woman with a big ranch. I've too much work for any woman to do. I'll marry any steady man who likes work and wants a good home if we think we can get along. So, you know, this was a great way of, of finding a mate. This couple met through a personal ad in terms of when we're asking what happened next. 
they met uh, through an ad in Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper in 1869. Um, she, Sarah, was her name, Sarah Baines, she traveled a long, long way to marry this gentleman. And what's interesting is the idea that at the time, that was her best option, right? Was to get on a train, travel to, to thousands of miles to somewhere she'd never been to marry a man she'd never met. But at the time, many women's options, particularly their economic options, were so limited um, that that seemed great. <laughs> um, okay, I'm, start, gonna, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna whiz through these a little bit. The Civil War, you get a fair number of personal ads. This one from a young soldier. Beauty nor wealth do not entice me by no means. I am by no means very choice. It's a good wife I'm after. And again, this ad in the New York Herald during the Civil War in the middle here. Matrimonial. An officer who is suffering from a wound and who has recently been released from Richmond is desiring of forming a correspondence with some lady for the purpose of cheering his drooping spirits. <laughs> um, so there were lots of personal ads during the Civil War. Ad continued to spread to every state in the nation and become more and more popular. By the 1870s, I was really finding lots and lots of ads. These are in the San Francisco Chronicle in the 1870s, in the middle column there towards the bottom, uh, from a, a widow lady, a young literary gentleman, not yet 30. You get them, uh, San Francisco Chronicle, the Los Angeles Times. Ads were very, very popular in California at this time as, uh, as the state was settled. Now, this is one of my favorite tales of what happened next. This is a couple who met through a personal ad in, in 1892. Augusta Larson was an immigrant from Sweden, working as a seamstress in Chicago. And in 1892, she saw a wife wanted ad that had been placed by Ole Rood, who was from rural Norway, but that had then um, emigrated to America and acquired a, a, a homestead in Washington state. At the age of 45, he decided to look for a wife. These two, wrote to each other for a few months. He then sent her the money, here's the receipt, to come and visit him. And she did, they got married, they had eight children, they prospered, they farmed the land, and they really became, you know, your typical example of, of pioneers in Washington state, pioneers of the, of the Pacific Northwest, showing that without personal ads, parts of America, it would have been a very, very different story. And therefore personal ads are in many ways central to the making of modern America in terms of how the nation was settled, how families were built, how the nation grew. Uh, ads in the Cincinnati Enquirer and many cities in the Midwest began to take on a slightly different tone in the 1860s. Um, these are personal ads that uh, ask, are looking for somebody for object fun and pleasure. So not just about marriage. Again, when people say, is it a new thing? You know, were people always looking for a serious relationship for marriage? I say, no, they were looking for all sorts of other things as well. Because this is a society in transition, right? So um, you, get, you get more and more different kinds of, of ads. Now, what you also get into the 1890s is a crime wave perpetrated through personal ads. I came across more and more stories in the 1890s, 1900s of fraud, bigamy, all kinds perpetrated through the personal ads. Here's one example. This is Marion Gray, who started a, um, a very, uh, a very under a defrauding matrimonial agency in Chicago uh, in the 1890s. The newspapers had a field day with her. She was on the front page when she got taken to court. Um, this was also the time when the New York Times kept printing stories about a guy they nicknamed the one-armed bigamist. He used to place personal ads, marry women, steal their life savings, and then disappear, um, committing bigamy over and over again. But because there wasn't like a national police force necessarily at the time, people couldn't piece together this crime wave. And yet it was happening crimes were being perpetrated in this way in every state in the nation. It was a time when people could just disappear and no one really noticed. And as a result, you got some very sad stories. Here's one of the saddest. Um, this woman, Belle Gunness, was America's worst ever female serial killer. She was originally from Sweden uh, and she ended up in Indiana. 
And in 1905, 1906, 1907, she placed an ad in various newspapers in the Midwest that read, Comely widow, who owns a large farm in one of the finest districts in LaPorte County, Indiana, desires to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided. Triflers need not apply. In 1908, when actually there was a fire at her ranch in Indiana, the police investigated the ranch and ended up finding over 40 bodies of men buried in the earth. Mostly immigrants, mostly men who had disappeared without their families or friends really knowing where they'd gone. This was a, a, a society where people did move around um, and disappear. Um, and personal ads, sadly, because of the anonymity they, they allowed, were perfect for that. Uh, this is another story, um, just one of my favorites, because this guy's uh, great granddaughter emailed me when I was researching my book and told me about her, how her great grandparents met through, met through a personal ad in 1911. Uh, this is an ad that was in the Denver Post. Um, and that really takes us back to this very first personal ad in New York City from 1788. Um, when newspapers have always been used to, to, to form relationships. Uh, ads have really changed amazingly little in terms of what men are looking for in a woman, what women are looking for in a man. What changes is that technology, right, is the way in which um, people do that. Um, uh, right, the way people do that. Because people are always going to be looking for love looking to form relationships, looking for a human connection, because in the end, that's why we're all here, right? To love and be loved. I could talk for hours more, but I'm gonna stop there in case there's any questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in um, and I have a few of my own. So yeah, we'll, we'll go through as many as we can. Um, the first question is, uh, what happened to the people with the, the glass eyes? Oh, I totally forgot to talk about them. That was the title of my talk. Thank you very much. My favorite personal ad of them all was in the New York Times in 1891. And it was from a man with a glass eye. Look, oh, it's from a young man with glass eye looking to meet young lady also with a glass eye. And what I love about it is the idea that um, there's somebody out there for everyone, right? However idiosyncratic or you want to meet someone who's got taste in common, interest in common, or the same kind of glass eye as you, what personal ads allow you to do is, is, to, is to, you know, find what you're looking for. And it was really as those emerged, as I say, when I found that ad in, in 1891, the guy who placed it was a railway inspector. Um, you know, you really get such a wonderful insight into into people, right? Into their idiosyncrasies. Great. Uh, and so the next question coming in is, uh, were there any mentions of um, enslavement in the ads? Uh, that is like seeking a wife experienced with owning slaves? Um, there were not, partly because um, ads were slower to spread to the southern states. Uh, so part of the frustration in, uh, in all of this was finding that, you know, enough ads generally in, in states in the South. Um, there were other, you know, obviously there were, there were ads in, involving, you know, slave owning in other ways, but in terms of um, these kind of personal ads, they tended to start in the North and therefore, no. Great. Um, and then, uh, two, two religious questions. Uh, when did religion and ethnicity start to be specified in the ads? And did the ads proliferate in uh, African American or Jewish newspapers? So really early on, people will say, um, looking for someone born in America or an American wanted. Again, you know, the, the definition of that is, um, is uh, up for discussion. So, uh, it was always interesting to know exactly what the person placing the ad meant by that. Um, through the 19th century, personal ads, as we've seen, really um, got taken 
got used a lot by immigrant communities, partly because lots of the, you know, whether it was like sweet, the Swedish immigrant community in Chicago or the Polish immigrant community in New York, because you're new in town, right? You don't have the networks that, that you would have um, from the country you'd immigrated from. So newspaper paper ads were a really, really great way of meeting a husband, meeting a wife. Um, again, um, I, there were fewer, Af fewer African-American ads, very, very few, which was an economic issue and a social issue. Um, and therefore the frustration actually in writing this book um, was the lack of diversity in these ads. But of course that's due to broad structural reasons why they, that, um, certain communities were unable or prevented from placing these kind of personal ads. To place ads like this, you needed to have a lot of freedom, uh, a fair amount of money, you know, and, and obviously there were some communities that didn't have one or, or both of those ideas. Uh, so the next question coming in is um, one of the exhibitions at the Ellis Island Museum, the Immigration Museum, um, about 19th century immigration when you had to pass through is about mail order brides. Um, and I don't know who wrote to whom, but the brides arrived and it got them into the country, but they couldn't change their minds if they uh, didn't like the man. So was, were there a lot of um, like international so right with personal ads not so much because of the geographical restraints you've got right you've got to be able to see it you've got to be able to place the ad and then somebody relatively nearby has got to see the ads and they tended not to they tended to stay geographically pretty close to home what was transformative was with the the railways from the 1860s onwards suddenly rather than just place an ad in your local newspaper and it just be seen by people in the immediate vicinity. Of course, with the opening of the railways and other form of you know, travel generally throughout the United States be, becoming more convenient, the newspapers and therefore the people reading them were going all over. And that's when you get, for example, people in California advertising for a husband or wife in an East Coast newspaper saying come out to california come you know come mar get married it's wonderful out here and you know often that worked because you get you know women sitting in the east coast with maybe not the opportunities they wanted and certainly not the financial opportunities they wanted and so sometimes their best option seemed to go to california so you get that kind of geographical dynamic but as i say with personal ads it's not a board that's why mail order brides is a slightly different dynamic Great. And uh, so our next question is sort of a, a twofer. Um, so were personal ads as prevalent in other countries? And did the language of American personal ads uh, differ from those, say, posted in uh, England? Um, in America, they appear very much uh, transactional. Right. So um, it was really fun to compare personal ads in England with personal ads in America. I wrote a previous book about these ads in, in, in England. As I said, they started in the 1690s. And um, what was really interesting is certainly some of the kind of national stereotypes did hold. So it certainly was true that right from the beginning, the personal ads placed in America were far more robust and straightforward about the economic realities of marriage. So the ones in England were kind of, you know, not quite as willing, not didn't want to be quite so open about the fact that, that it was like about money. Whereas in, in America, people were very open about that straight away, just, you know, very straightforward and honest um, about it straight away. So that was, that was an interesting kind of national stereotype that like the Brits don't want to kind of talk about money or, you know, or be kind of as direct as the Americans. And actually that national stereotype did kind of hold when it came to, to personal ads. Um, when did the, like the lexicon start to change and like the abbreviations start to come in? I know everybody thinks of like, right. you know, SWF yeah, and me. all the others, but right. yeah. Great question. So it took a while for the lexicon to emerge because to have any kind of lexicon, you need enough people to be familiar with the, the kind of the textual, um, habits, right? Uh, uh with what's normal and what's not normal. People need to get comfortable with the language to be able to play with the language. So um, abbreviations in personal ads are far more recent than you might think. You really get the first ones in the 1960s and the 1970s is when um, for, you know, abbreviations were like would like to meet or GSOH, good sense of humor, um, 
emerge very, very recently, the 1960s and 1970s, only when you've really got a large body of personal ads so that people are familiar enough and then there's room to, to play around with the language, right? But until that point, it's tricky. And um, like at the, at the peak, about how many personal ads were appearing in the paper and were they all clustered together in the classifieds or were they spread out amongst the quack right. medicine and the people looking for horses and bonnets and... Right, so the peak of these kind of ads was probably the 1890s where you just really get them in every state and lots and lots, particularly in New York newspapers, so many of them. Um, so from the 1860s, the New York Times had them on the front page um, and actually lots of newspapers had them on the front page, which shows actually that many newspaper editors realized they were a form of in entertainment, right? That people were reading the, these ads um, for fun. So lots of them were on the front page. Um, sometimes then they moved further inside and, and as we saw were, were merged amongst, you know, room for rent or horse for sale. Uh, but the peak in the 1890s, I would say you were in, um, in New York newspapers or like the St. Louis newspapers or Baltimore newspapers, you were getting maybe 10 a day. Now, some of those would be repeated throughout the week or whatever, but I would say about 10 a day. And bear in mind, this is in like all these newspapers. And then you're also getting a couple a day in like no local newspapers. So far, far, far more ads than I would have expected. Um, and were you able to follow through on the success of, of any of the writers? I know you um, yeah, so touched few. on the couple in right, Washington. So we talked about, exactly. We talked about Augusta Larson and Sarah Redmond. And, and then some people have emailed me saying, oh, my great grandparents met this way or whatever. So I have a few. But here's the thing. When people meet through a personal ad or a dating website or a dating app and they fall in love and they live happily ever after, that's not a fun story. How boring is that? No one wants to hear about that. You don't read about that in a newspaper. You don't, um, you know, you don't read about that anywhere. That's mostly a boring story to people. When you read about personal ads is when someone got murdered, someone got their life savings stolen, someone, you know, whatever. You, you read about the crime stories, the very salacious stories. And that gives, that can give the researcher, the historical researcher, a bit of a skewed view, right? You only read about the unhappy stories, not the happy stories. So um, it's frustrating. And for me, it was frustrating not to be able to follow up as many as I could. But occasionally you do get glimpses. Um, and I hope now I will continue to get emails from around the world and, and particularly around America, people saying, hey, my great grandparents met this way and, and here's the ad. And those, those emails I do get periodically and it's thrilling every single time. Um, how did you conduct the research for this book? Was it mostly through online archives? Did you have to go to the library and scroll through microform? Like right. So um, initially, I spent a lot of time trawling through newspapers. But what was fascinating was just in the over the period of time in which I researched this book, it has been exactly when so many newspaper archives have been digitized. So when I started it, I was taking my computer to um, uh, well, I, I did a lot of the research in UCLA, in Los Angeles, or um, in DC, and in New York, and I was having to go to the library. But over the course of the five years in which I researched this book, more and more and more of these um, newspapers have been digitized, and then I've been able to do it, you know, from my from my house, sitting here at my computer. So it's actually this book and this research has been a really interesting and I think wonderful example of the way that digitization has it's liberated the historical researcher to be able to find out so much more information more and more books and and research is going to emerge because of the these newspapers and other material being being digitized and while you know the romance is taken out because it's such fun to go to a newspaper and go through the microfilms or the actual newspapers actually having it all digitized is amazing for a researcher and that's been 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 really fun and really exciting it also means and i would recommend this to any of you it means you can spend a bored saturday night when it's raining outside trawling through you know the new york times from 1863 or the san francisco chronicle from 1870 and call me weird but that is honestly my my idea of a great night in it's such fun i would really recommend it Great. Well, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions.
um, coming in. So last call, um, if anybody has any anything that they're dying to know, uh, please put it in the chat. Um, but yes, thank you so much. This was a really fantastic way to spend our lunchtime. Um, and thank there's you a so link much for having me. It's been really fun. To buy the book again. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank, thank you, you guys. Thanks all for coming. I really appreciate it.